want to publish something on that. Uh, that's going to be my topic of discussion. And I'm going to formalize a principle so that now when we talk about the principle, I don't have to talk about the individual beliefs. The individual beliefs are now consolidated in a more general concept, and that concept is the principle. Right? So for me, what I do is I take the things, and I'm really giving a lot here. <laughs> I'm giving you a freaking ton here. This is a gem of gems. But I think, you know, it's, it's good to really step outside of the complex epistemological discourse into something really practical, like academic writing, to prove, if you will, that this works. It's not a matter of if this works. It's not a matter of if what I'm telling you is correct. It's a matter of you recognizing how to do what I'm telling you. You can or you can't, I don't really care. It, it's helped me profoundly in my career and it's gonna make, it's gonna make you that much stronger, right? That's the whole point. This is empowerment, this is to empower. I mean, most of you who are taking the time to watch this boring series anyway are already probably in a good state of affairs personally because you have the type of time to watch something as ridiculous as a freaking several hour long epistemology lecture series on the internet for free. But the idea is, you know, you can't take this very sort of macro level, and this is really what it is, right? It, in a sense, it's a macro, micro level. But it's the macro in the micro. It is the recognition of both, right? There's a holistic understanding, a macro level, which would be sort of external to the content knowledge. And you have a very internal um, internal to the point that we can talk about the individual belief, right? I'm not going to begin with the individual belief because we recognize the twofold, threefold problem that, that inheres in that attempt. But once we recognize that we can consolidate those beliefs, excuse me, once we recognize that we can consolidate those, consolidate those beliefs into general principles, we can take that concept of consolidation, right? And I'm doing something more than Stroud or even Descartes said, this is uniquely me is you can apply the same concept to your own academic writing. And you can use that to inform your understanding of the concept. It's, it's this very sort of um, uh, interrelated relationship, right, in which we can come about a greater, more complex epistemological understanding, right? So the idea is the contents of the structure, in a sense, of my knowledge is formalized in this really precise sort of modality, where my principles are segmented and my principles consolidate individual beliefs. So that's the rudimentary bits of our analysis. Why is that important? I just gave you a reason why it's important. Because if you really get good at this, you can identify the things that you believe, group it on a sheet of paper, try to find how those beliefs are interconnected, the relationship between the concepts, conceptually speaking, look at a principle, and then take um, principles and and this this is sort of this idea isn't generally speaking um, represented in a one to one sort of transposition between epistemology and grounded theory, but in qualitative research there is this type of research that you can do called grounded theory, which is heavy on sort of coding various forms of coding, and the whole idea of grounded theory and the coding within grounded theory is really an epistemological approach. It's, it's what did the participant say in your interview? Here are the things that the participant believed. These beliefs that the participant has are interrelated. My belief that my, my husband loves me, da, 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 da. my belief that I live a good life, ba, 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 ba. and then you can generalize those beliefs into governing principles. And then you can cross code and blah, blah, blah. This conceptual ability to think, this, this, this type of thinking lends itself very, very easily to taxonomic sort of identification. It lends itself very, very easily to sort of mathematical, precise, um, sort of census-based, statistically verifiably based analysis. Some will take this on a deep end and want to externalize the internal validity of this organization, which becomes problematic. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, kudos to you. But we're nowhere near that discussion just yet. So I want to stop there before I get any deeper. So middle of page six. Our senses play, then, an integral role in our acquisition of knowledge. I need to know the role, and I'll talk about this in a second, I need to know the role that our senses play in acquiring knowledge. And here's a quote. Quote, the importance of, 
the importance of the senses as a source of as a source or channel of knowledge seems undeniable. The idea still becomes well, what is the nature I had the question mark right here, right? What is the nature of reliability? We understand the content knowledge now to the point where we can at least theoretically discuss content knowledge in terms of a very, very macro and simultaneously a very, very micro level and simultaneously the relationship between the macro and the micro. You should be able to do that now. I've discussed that for an hour and 30 minutes. The idea then is how do we relate that to this idea of reliability? What does it mean to talk about the functional the function of reliability. Reliability immediately assumes a correlation, right? I mean, it's sort of inherent within the definition, a priori, in the definitional constructs of the concept of reliability is the assumption of correlation. Reliability between two things. What is reliability? Um, it's comparative. So we have one aspect of reliability, right? The second aspect it actually is twofold. I'm going to do the easier of the two now because the, the more difficult of the two is not discussed in this section yet. Well, the reliability between what I know and what is. In the is, um, in the beginning of section 1.1, the previous section, I talked about obviously intoxication. So an individual is intoxicated, you're, you're high on drugs, or you're intoxicated with alcohol, and, and your perceptive abilities are, are affected by your intoxicated brain state, you assume that uh, your perception is accurate, obviously, there's an assumption here, you step as though your perception is accurate and you fall flat on your face. Uh, why? Because there was a breakdown between the correspondence of what you thought and what was, or what is. This correspondence, quote unquote, breakdown, and you guys know where this goes later, but I'm introducing concepts very generally here. The breakdown in the correspondence between the contents of your thought and the external world resulted in an inability for the perceiver to properly function in the world. Thus, an outside perceiver could look at you and say, hey, something's off with this dude, right? Look at how he walks. He's walking in a certain manner. You must, I mean, sobriety test, obviously, is an attempt to assess the correspondence. Since the officer can't gain epistemological access to the contents of your thought or the contents of your brain state, he can, or she can, the officer, ask you to perform a sobriety test, and then the sobriety test is based on the idea that I've legitimized that your brain state is off. There's a huge problem, epistemologically speaking, with that, however, in a more nuanced, more difficult, more contemporary, more complicated discussion in terms of autistic individuals and their being in the world, in a Heideggerian sense. I have to give a little bit to more advanced uh, epistemologists and more advanced viewers, so if this, this bit doesn't make sense, then just hold on for a couple seconds and I'll go back to a more introductory sort of analysis. The problem is that assumption um, informs the belief that the way in which human bodies function in the world is itself prone to normativization. There is a proper way to walk. There is a proper way to sit. There's a proper, it's sort of, not even etiquette. I mean, the general t assessment would be etiquette, but it really isn't etiquette. So that if you walk in an awkward way, someone would say, there's something wrong with that dude's brain. Or, you know, maybe he's drunk, or maybe he's got problems. There's an inherent problem in this assessment. Reliability, then, on a much deeper level, and I promise I'll go deeper than this, because it's an introductory account, reliability, then, itself could be problematized. Because the question then becomes, we recognize the function now of reliability for the perceiver. Reliability is a means of assessing the correspondence between the internal contents of the perceiver's thoughts and the functional relationship of those contents to the external world. Okay, cool. So now I can answer the question. No biggie. But the idea is, what are the assumptions that reliability itself is informed by? And though it's not said, Stroud doesn't say this, Descartes doesn't say this, this is all me. It's my lecture series, so I get to teach it the way I want to teach it. Now, my caution to young epistemologists is don't just swallow this wholesale. Right? Don't just swallow this wholesale. When I was taught this, I, I, I wasn't given this, this caveat. I wasn't given this warning. I had to, based on my own research and my interaction with other people, recognize that this could lead 